And I sing about your mercy, and I sing about your love, your goodness, Lord, your righteousness. I want to sing a song of your faithfulness, a song of your grace, and of your loving kindness, to the glory of your name, with everything that's in you, Lord, listen to me say, I want to sing a song of And I sing about your love, your goodness, Lord, your righteousness. I want to sing a song of your faithfulness, a song of your grace, and of your loving kindness to the glory of your name. With everything that's in you, Lord, listen to me say, I want to sing a song of Welcome everyone. It's so chaotic outside right now. 
But in here, we get to worship an awesome God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says this, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So please, turn off your cell phones. So settle in. Let's get ready to worship and hear an insightful message. We are so excited that you are here with us today.
beside you. Amen. Lord God, we come into this sanctuary this morning to give you honor and glory and praise. Receive it at our at our mouths and at our hands, Lord God, and we will uh, bring it to you to honor your name. Amen.
sinking deeper, Lord God, into the love that surrounds us. You are good, Lord God, and your mercy towards us will endure forever. Receive our praise, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to be able to, in our, in our finite being, Lord God, to draw near to you. Draw us, Lord God, with your mercy and grace. Draw us with your love. Trust by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning. We give you honor and praise. If you got a prayer need this morning, we'd love to have the honor to pray with you. We believe that God answers prayers. He wants to hear our voices as we cry out to him this morning. So if you got something, go ahead and come on up.
Colossians 3, 15 through 17 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you and Go. Oh. 
This morning we just ask that you would truly do that, that you would shine upon us, that your glory would be here in our presence, that it would just be something that we speak about, something that we just read about in scripture, something we understand intellectually, but today would be an experiential revelation of just your glory with us. Lord, that when we're with you, there is a peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, that no matter what's going on, no matter how turbulent the world can seem and feel, no matter what the economic data points to, no matter what the bosses say, no matter what's going on in our families, there is a peace that comes knowing that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the great I Am is in our presence. Lord, that one word from you changes entire situations. One touch from you heals is, heals all sickness and disease one word from you commands evil forces unclean spirits to be gone and so lord this morning we just look to you the author and finisher of our faith and just ask that we would experience your goodness once again this morning that fears would be cast away that peace would be poured out to our hearts that frustration and anger and bitterness that so easily tries to entangle and trip us up, Lord, be replaced with love and mercy and gentleness. Lord, we just continue to thank you that your blessing is going before us as we just spend time in your presence this morning. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate it. You guys can give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Well, it's nice to be back. For those who don't know, I'm Pastor Brian, the youth pastor, associate pastor, catch-all pastor, especially now that Pastor Danny's out of town, so that all falls down to me. But in a serious note, I know some of you have been praying for Kate and I. Thank you so much. I was actually never sick. It was just precautionary that I was gone, but Kate's just finishing up recovering, so she's still home today, but appreciate everybody's prayers, but nothing was super critical. We weren't in any life-threatening situations, just to, to let you know, but thank you for your prayers. And while I'm talking, if you're a guest here, if you can take a minute and fill out a Get to Know You card, it's sitting in the chair in front of you. We just want to say thanks for being here. We realize that there's a lot of great churches around here that you could be worshiping God in or exploring. If you don't know who God is, like I'm just kind of checking out this whole God thing. There's a lot of great places, but we're glad you're here with us this morning. So we'd like to be able to say thanks for being here. I'd like to get to know you a little bit. And then finally, if there's any way we can pray for you, we do believe God truly is a God who's alive and does answer prayers still today. And so anything we could pray for, we'd love to have the honor and privilege. And that's kept completely confidential, so you don't have to worry about it being in, you know, an email chain or on Snapchat, Instagram, or whatever else is out there, Gitter, I don't know, there's a billion social media platforms. So we'll be on none of them, so you're perfectly safe there. And you can put that connection card right in that box by the double doors. Or if you'd like to meet somebody personally and just say hi, we'd love to have the opportunity. I'll personally 
be after service out at the connection hub, which is out these double doors to your right. There's that countertop, kitchen island looking thing. That's the connection hub. Love to say hi to you there. And with that, I want to just, it was this morning as we're singing and I was thinking about just the way things are going. And, you know, I realize this is the part of the service. Some of you have been here for a long time. Like, okay, this is the part we're going to talk about money, giving. But I want to just say, I just appreciate the servant heartedness of the, the people of this church. It's just, I pull up and Richard's out there helping me to unload teas so that our food pantry people could be happy that there's teas, specifically one individual who I'm looking at. Yeah, so that I can live a little longer. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going in to do and get, I see coffee's not done. People are willing to jump in and help make sure common coffee's ready. So if you haven't gotten coffee, there's coffee out there for after service whenever you need it. If you're like me, you need it like ASAP in the morning. And you know, just, the, it's just sometimes I think, and I can't go through and name everybody, but just sometimes it just goes unnoticed how much people actually do. And I just want to say thank you. We have a Pastor Jeff, the staff, and everybody. Just for everything you guys do as a church, your heart to serve God. I know people jumped in for prayer. People have jumped in for kids ministry. Just in general, a servant-hearted nature. And I just want to recognize that and say thank you to you so much. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Jeff. I mean, the staff's doing this kind of here for that. But just, it's an incredible thing. And honestly, even when we're giving, we're not giving to just some random organization. We're pooling our resources together because we're a collective family that's advancing the gospel. It's not that we're just sending it off to some random organization. They might be great organizations. Some of, I know some of you support different parachurch places. You're like, hey, I really like what this group does. I really like helping with feeding people around the world. Or I like that this does disaster relief. Or I like this helps people who are being trafficked. There's a lot of great organizations. But when we're giving here, I know we're giving to God, yes. But we're collectively as a family. It's not going to just some random place. You're, we're, we're working together as a team. And it's an incredible thing that when that happens, and let me just share this final story. I was listening to a pastor of a very large church, Rick Warren, that probably brings up different opinions from other people. I'm not a big Rick Warren fan, just to be upfront and honest, but I'm listening and I'm like, oh, this is kind of interesting what he's saying. And he said there's a church size, he calls the Tiger Church. It's about the size of our church. It's kind of this, we're in that range. And he said, the thing about Tiger Church is it's, it survives no matter what. The church is resilient because it's not about how big we are. It's not about what we do. It's about being a part of a family. And because we're family, we stick together no matter what happens. And so I just wanted to say that, again, just as we talk about giving, that we are a part of a family. We're giving, we're working together, and we're doing the work of God as a family. Not strangers, not a team, but family. And so just I'm glad and thank you for being a part of this family. And if you feel like God's putting it in your heart as family to say hey let's continue to do what god's doing this is your opportunity to give there's three ways you can do that there's offering envelopes in front of you you can feel free to use cash or check if you want to give digitally you can go to text sunrise to 833-345-5945 or you can go to the website or on the app click the donate tab if you don't want to give there's no pressure but if you feel like god's putting on your heart it's a great opportunity to just continue to make sure the gospel of jesus christ the greatest news that ever has been ever will be People can hear it. And with that, we pray. And then there's an announcement video. Lord, I thank you for your generosity that has, first and foremost, given us everything we need, so many wants. And as you put it in our heart to give back to you, to your kingdom, and the work you're doing, I thank you that with a joyful heart, with gladness, with excitement, we can give to you. Not out of compulsion, not out of obligation, not out of being manipulated but out of sheer response to your love that we give back. And I ask that you would use this offering, this gift, to continue to advance the good news that we can continue to be a light in this community and around the world. And also I ask that you would bless back each giver, that you would continue to reward and bless the faithfulness of each individual and family who continues to give to those who are just for the first time, like I'm going to step out in faith and give, that you would bless them back for their faithfulness, for their generosity, and Lord, we just open our hearts up now at this point, serve us a little bit more. We've already been worshiping you. We just ask that now you would fill us with wisdom, with understanding, and bring transformation in our life. In your name, Jesus, amen. And before Pastor Jeff speaks, please check out the announcement video. Hey, Sunrise Church. All right, so if you open up your bulletin, you've seen something new today. There's this three-by-five card in there. It's a new way of to get to know you. On the directory, in the programming that we use to keep everybody's information up to date, a lot of people have moved and it kind of messed the system up. So 
a lot of people in our church were born in 1999. I don't know why, but everybody was born in 1999. So we need to fix that. So if you can go through, fill this out, put it in the um, offering container at the back of the double doors, or come see me at the hub, drop it off. We'd love to really get to know you. There's two sides. Fill it out for your household. If your kids have already moved out, don't put your kids' information on there. Let them fill out their own for their own household. We'd love to connect with you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. We will hear arguments in Roe against Wade. You may proceed. If you really want to know how abortion became legal in our country, I will tell you the true story. Dr. Mildred Jefferson, would you like to head up a Right to Life group that I'm starting? Dr. Bernard Nathanson's clinics are performing a thousand abortions per week. That's why I'm taking up the fight. I wanted to get abortion legalized across the country. We're looking for a pregnant girl to challenge the abortion laws. We'll give her a pseudonym, call her Jane Roe. It's genius that we no one will ever know about her past. First they came after the Jews, and then they came after the mentally deficient. We did nothing, and now they're coming after the unborn. And so you're gonna do nothing? Robert Byrd for Henry Wade. No judge or jury in their right mind would ever let abortion happen in Texas. You've been watching too much TV. This case has nothing to do with women's rights. It's God's duty to forgive. It's ours to rule the law. You're changing your vote because your family found out. Or, or was it the media? If we don't sort this out, fur will fly today. You are trying to control this Warren, old buddy. That is completely unethical. In the matter of Roe v. Wade, I want the case re-argued. Faith in God, respect for his law. That law being? Human law. We got the majority. We're gonna win. Perhaps this is beyond the authority of the Supreme Court. We are the law of the land. These girls should not be put through the pregnancy and should be entitled to an abortion. God forgive me, what have I done? The true silent minority. Who is speaking for these children? Excuse me. Excuse me. Down in front? Down. Yeah, down in front. Oh. Hi, I'm setting up, sitting here, getting all comfy in my seat, getting ready to watch Roe vs. Wade. It's going to be here in the sanctuary at church on January 23rd at 4 p.m. Doors open at 3.30. But after the movie, the missions committee is put, hosting a pizza fundraiser. So come join us. $5 will get you pizza, a soft drink, chips, and if you talk real nice to the missions committee, we may include a cookie or something, something sweet. So come join us for $5 right after the movie, Roe vs. Wade, on Sunday, January the 23rd at 4 p.m. Thanks so much, see you there, bye. Thursday night women's Bible study is back. We'll be studying the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. It starts January 27th. If you'd like to join us, sign up at the Hub. We do want you to remember, too, we have our annual business meeting, which will take immediate place immediately after service uh, next Sunday. So we will make you aware of that. We'll try to keep it cogent and quick. How many of you like really long business meetings? You want to be here from the end of service right up to the movie? I didn't think so. We'll try to keep it shorter than that, and I think that will be, that'll be good. So praise the Lord. Um, I have to give some credit to Roberta for uh, the uh, opening illustration today. She, uh, she and I were having a conversation about snow removal. I don't know if she remembers it, but it was actually uh, very helpful in my head. How many of you like going outside? Uh, kids are released. I'm sorry, I see Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Kids are released for kids' ministry. Lindsay is doing that today. We are so appreciative. Awesome. Yes. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Kids are fun. So how many of you like to go out into the parking lot and not really have to think about whether it's slippery or not? Is that nice? Now, now what do you do? Somebody tell you, what do you do when you go out and the snow has just fallen? And, and you know, how do you navigate differently than you do now? 
Time the shovel, you, you nudge Mike, okay? Anybody else, how do you handle it? Send the kids. Send the kids. Now, what if you're in service and it snows while we're here? What do you do? You can't really get Mike to shovel a whole lot. The kids can't, can't drive the car. So how do you handle it? Slower. How many of you kind of do the shuffle? You know, you're a little bit, how many of you just go out there and run at top speed across the lot as fast as you can when it's slick? John says he does. All right. Man. No, we kind of aware of that, right? You're aware of that. So we were talking about, you know, the whole snow shoveling, ice handling, salt thing, because it's one of the bills that we pay here at church all the time. That's why we were talking about it. And how many of you know it doesn't really cost that much to plow? It costs a lot to salt. I mean, if I could just pay for a plow and not have to pay for that salt, we'd save like two-thirds. That would just be great. And then so we were kind of talking about why they salt so much. And they started thinking, we have two different problems here. Snow is something you can remove with a plow or a shovel, right? You just go out there and you move it out of the way. It doesn't take very long, although I would probably, like, devastate the lawn if I had a truck with a plow on it. I have no experience in that, so I'd probably knock stuff over, but you know, I, that's not that hard once you've done it. Now, for, I've seen Fred. I've ridden with Fred. He hasn't killed anybody or knocked anything over, and he's plowed a lot of people's driveways with kindness. That's a good thing. Why do we use salt? Melt the ice. Why do you just plow the ice? It doesn't move. So you drop that blade down, and it doesn't care how many horsepower you've got behind it. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine trying to plow ice? How do you do that? I mean, if you could nail the ice hard enough with the blade to break it, you'd have to rip the asphalt of the pavement up while you shoved the, the ice, if it was possible. It, it doesn't get solved that way. So unfortunately, cost-wise for us, we, you know, we have to have a vendor that throws salt everywhere. And physically, salt lowers the melting point by mixing with the water, by infiltrating it. It begins to melt the ice and dissolve it. And eventually, you don't have to go out there and ice skate to your car. So different solutions to different problems. Even though both problems are frozen water, one's just floaty snow and pretty white, Till the dogs get to it. And the other is, you know, black ice, clear ice, all kinds of weird things can happen. Yeah. Different solutions, the same problem. Uh, the other thing that I have to give her credit for, she passed on word that somebody, I think it might have been Holly, maybe it might have been you, Holly, that was saying forgiveness would be a good thing to study. Did you tell her that? Because she told me that. So I was like, okay, in this series, I thought that was some, some kudos. In this series, I, I began to realize, how many of you know that, that forgiveness and offense are a little bit like snow and ice? It's the same problem, hurt feelings, but they require different solutions. And there's different reasons for them. So we talked about one thing that can stand in the way of discipleship a couple of weeks back, which was that idea of processing offense properly. But I did come up with some questions in my mind, and I don't think I'm the only one that did. So I'll ask you these questions first, and then we'll read the text. We're going to be in Matthew 18 again, same chapter, and we're going to start the 21st verse. But first of all, I'm going to ask the question, what happens? Matthew 18 is predicated on the fact that we're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ, right? The principle would still work. Could you use Matthew 18, at least in part, with an unbeliever? Yeah, at least in part, right? You could, instead of going to get all your best friends to support you and drill the person to hurt your feelings, you could privately go to them. They don't have to be a believer for that to be a more respectful way to handle the problem. But, and you could go one more step if that didn't work and, and try to get a witness to make sure not that they were, you know, doing wrong, but that you didn't do wrong either to keep you on the straight and narrow. They, they don't have to be a believer for that. But Matthew 18 ends with the idea that if somebody doesn't respond to those first steps, that you can bring the authority of the church in. What if you're dealing with an unbeliever that doesn't give up about the authority of the church? How do you handle it then? All of a sudden, it's ice and snow. You know, your unsaved neighbor doesn't care if your church thinks they're wrong. Why should they? They're going to go on. You can't shun somebody that's not part of the community. 
They don't care. There's no authority there. So that's kind of the first place where Matthew 18 breaks down and you can't plow ice with people that do not receive the authority of the church. Second, have you ever had a, a hurt that's just too complicated to solve with simple confrontation? I'll give you an illustration. I've used it before. You may remember it. You may not. It doesn't really matter. But years ago, I became aware of something that was happening in a church situation to my parents. And it was pretty painful. And, you know, what was being done kind of to them wasn't right. And the more I found out, the less I liked it. But I lived 700 miles away from where it was taking place. And I wasn't really supposed to know any of this. It had come to me from third parties, so to speak, and then I did my research. How do you confront people when you're not supposed to know what you know? How do you deal with the the, the hurt feelings of people that don't know that you're upset about their hurt feelings? It was complicated. And I spent the better part of a couple years letting that, I did not know how to Matthew 18 that one. I let that sink into me and cause a bitterness and an anger and a frustration that was not productive to my discipleship walk. Not at all. I was really, really angry. God finally brought me to a place where, thankfully, he did resolve it in another way. And, you know, I was like, oh, thank you, Lord, because that was just becoming an abscess in me that really, really drove me crazy. And so I saw a healing. But what if you're in that situation? And you can't deploy Matthew 18 because, well, you're not supposed to know. How many of you have ever been hurt by somebody who's dead? I'm not saying, obviously, they hurt you after they died. Probably that's not easy to do. But, you ever had somebody say something cruel about you? Or untruthful? And it hurt. It hurt a great deal. And yet that person, for whatever reason, it didn't get resolved, and then they're dead. Kind of hard to go to them in private. Kind of hard to get a witness. Kind of hard to get the church involved. Again, plowing ice. It doesn't help. They're dead. But that pain is still real. It's still in you. It still drives you. Now, you might sit there and go, oh, that doesn't drive me. I have wait, I've talked to way too many people in the course of my life who are still bearing the pain of something that somebody did 30, 40, 50 years ago that's dead. I remember Diane's mom, who I liked. You know, some people would joke about our mother-in-laws. I, I liked my mother-in-law. She had her issues, but I did. I liked her. But her dad once said something she thought was unkind. She wanted to do a certain career, and he told her, oh, women shouldn't do that. You should just be a secretary. Now, how many of you know that's misogynistic, and it was the pro- the process of a mind that was trained in the 30s and 40s, and that was the way the world worked back then. And he was a pretty nice guy. I don't even think he meant it to be dismissive or angry to his daughter. But she let that sink into her heart. She was angry about that. She didn't get along with her parents till the day they died. And once they were dead, how do you resolve that problem? She never did. She let that gnaw at her until she passed several years ago. And then, what if you've already tried Matthew 18 and you didn't get a resolution? Are there people who might be brothers and sisters in Christ who might go, nah, 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 if you tell them that you're hurt? Don't look shocked at me. That happens. Sometimes, and this is the famous one that I've noticed in, in church life. People that offend, and anybody calls their attention to their offense, and they just go down the road to the next church. And of course, they'd say nothing at the next church about what they did. They might say how badly they were hurt by the last church they were at, but they never really tell the story. How do you resolve the pain? They've left, you still hurt. Well, I find that here in Matthew chapter 18. Peter carries on the conversation that Jesus finishes. We we go through the, the scripture passages, if you remember for a couple weeks ago, that literally binding and loosing things, if you go back to Matthew 18, you know, 17, 18, 19, the binding and loosing things in prayer comes out of the con- the conversation of dealing with offense. They're not standalones. 
So I'm not saying you can't bind or lose spiritual things. You can and you do, and that's appropriate, but that's where it comes from. Binding pain, binding conflict, binding lies, you know, bringing those to an end, okay? That's important. And then the idea of agreeing together on earth in prayer about anything. That comes out of that conversation. So Jesus has given us in, you know, prior to verse 21 in chapter 18, he's given us this wonderful conflict solution so that we can grow in Christ. Verse 21, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now, how many of you realize that prior to this, the word forgiveness was not used? <laughs> Sinned against was used. In some translation, you have ought against your brother. We can imply that forgiveness is in there, but the word is not used in most translations. Peter sees to the ice section. Okay, we plowed the snow, Jesus. I mean, they didn't say that. They didn't get a lot of snow in Israel. <laughs> but you see the illustration. So what do I do? I, I go through and I, I plow it out of the way and, and we have the confrontation and we try to resolve the issue. But at the end, my brother has sinned against me. I got to deal with that hardness, that frozenness, that, that slipperiness that's in my life. How often if they sin, should I forgive them? And Peter is trying to be here real, really a good guy. Up to seven times? Let's put that in context for a minute. What, is, what would it be if somebody sinned against you? Let, let's make it really kind of crazy. So you come into church, and you sit down in this chair, and somebody comes up and grabs the chair and throws your butt on the floor and sits down in it. Has that ever happened in this church? <laughs> I don't think so. That would be, you know, I mean, is it the worst sin against you that you can imagine? Of course not. There are worse things that can happen, but it would be rather remarkable, wouldn't it? I mean, it would be rather remarkable if somebody threw you out of your chair and sat down in it because they wanted that chair. How many of you would say that, okay, that's kind of sinning against, my brother sinning against me. That would be problematic. The word is overused today, but yeah, yeah, it would be. Okay, so so now you are a good Christian individual, and you're sitting on the floor, or laying on the floor, looking at this person in your chair, and you say, oh, yeah, I can forgive that. How many of you would maybe have a little bit of trouble forgiving that? You might have to think about it at least a little bit, okay, before you get there. All right, maybe some of you go, yes, I want to be super forgiving. I'll do it right from the get-go. Now you come in next week and you sit in the chair. Same one. Same one. You're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> and they come and they throw your butt on the floor again and they sit in your chair. How do you think now? Now we've just gone from offense to ridiculous. Yeah, this is, you know, are you going to say, oh, I forgive you. Be back next week. See you next time. How many of you will probably have a harder time the second time? You know, fool me once, shame on you, know, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me seven times, how big of a fool am I? Right? I mean, we would have a problem with this. So Peter is going to Jesus and he's saying, okay, okay, I've done the Matthew 18. I've tried to resolve the problem and it doesn't work. And now the only thing I can really do is decide to forgive. How many times should I do this? How many iterations do I have to go through to be on the side of the angels? If you want to say you want to walk in discipleship, how do I continue to grow in you, Jesus? How many times do I have to forgive? Now, if you said seven times, if you really would be forgiving, seven weeks in a row somebody throws you on the floor, you're made of better material than I am. Good for you. But wouldn't you think Jesus would be super pleased with that? You put up with that seven times? Jesus said to him, I did not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, imagine that. Imagine 490 weeks in a row being thrown on your butt. You'd have a lot of bruises. You'd be really embarrassed. I mean, after all, you must like it if you're, if you're going to go four. How many of you realize that Jesus picked a really big number? Not because he's expecting you to count 489, 490. I mean, now I can punch you out. That's not the point. 
Jesus gave a really big number that forgiveness should be a part of who we are. So when you run into situations where people are not subject to church authority and therefore confrontation won't work, or when things are too complicated so you don't really know where to start, or with those who are, are dead, you know what I mean, or you simply have tried and it's failed, those four areas, the only solution necessary that handles the ice rather than the smell is to say, I forgive you. Now, what does it mean to forgive someone? You don't hold it against them. Okay, good. What does it mean to not hold it against somebody? Oh, I like that. Thank you, Mike. You're free from it. You're freeing yourself from it and them from it. True. Practical terms. Yeah, Dave. Well, you do. Once you forgive them, what happens? I mean, that much, yeah. Like, oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you, lay those things, you lay those things aside. You choose not to be angry with them anymore. Okay, this is dangerous. But I'm going to ask you for a moment or two to think about a situation where somebody hurt, you, hurt your feelings, treated you badly. Dangerous to do in church, right? Think about one of those experiences. Isn't it interesting how it doesn't take very long for you to get upset about that? If I sat here and I continued to talk about the time that somebody hurt you, how many of you would maybe feel your blood pressure start to go up a few notches? And you remember, you remember what they said to you, and she did this, and he did that, and and, 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 and you get all revved up again. And you were calm when you came in. You weren't even thinking about it, but all of a sudden it has a way. That situation, that offense, that wrong, you couldn't solve it, you didn't solve it, it's frozen into you now. And the reason I say this stands in the way of our discipleship is it can T-bone you like a, a, a rope garden intersection. You know, you're going through and you think you're growing in Jesus and things are great, Well, I'm worshiping, and in an instant, a song, a sound, a word, a memory, a smell, a person can suddenly bring up all these things that were never resolved and they hurt you. And in a moment, you are not worshiping God. You are not thinking about all the wonderful ways you can serve. You are not. It doesn't mean that you're a terrible person. I'm not beating on you, adding to the pain. I'm just saying this is an instant that just, just it's a landmine. Mike. Yes. Yes. And here's the tough thing. Saying the words, I forgive you. Let's practice it. Ready? I forgive you. Not hard. What did that cost you? A little air past your teeth, right? What hard. Can you say those words? I mean, literally right there. Did you mean them when you said them? No, you had nothing to mean them about, right? I, I said, let's say them. You went, okay. I, uh, piece of cake. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. What does it mean? I don't know. Who cares? You just popped him first. <laughs> oh, you popped him first? <laughs> so, so you get into the situation, seeing the words doesn't cost you much. But what happens when you actually do lay that down. And you do say, I no longer have a right to be angry about that situation again. Yeah. And yeah, you, you come to peace. I wish that peace was always the immediate feeling. You know, I mean, think of how easy it would be to forgive. As soon as I forgive, as soon as I make this decision, I'm going to have this wonderful instant peace. We'd, we'd all be doing it. Right? It would be the easiest thing in the world. It would be the most pleasant thing. But how many of you have ever had to forgive? And it was tough to get there. Maybe it was good afterwards, but it's tough to get there. Because you... Here's part of learning to forgive. Realizing that the right to be angry isn't yours. The right... But you don't know! You don't know what was done. 
done to me. You don't know how she hurt me, how he hurt me, how they cost me my job, how I lost the opportunity to buy that house. They cheated on me. They whatever. You don't know. No, I don't. I'm not trying to look into your particular hurts and say that, well, your hurts aren't worthwhile. Not my point. Because I have to look just at the same way at my own hurts and say, but I don't have a right. Why? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repent. So it's not my right to carry that load of anger. And it isn't healthy, is it? Anybody want to carry just a little cancer? How many of you would rather not? Rather not have just a little COVID, just a little... Nah. You like to have pure, clean, healthy body? It's beneficial. And yet, it's amazing how we grab hold of a situation. And even the Peter is here in this text. Seven times, God. Now, Peter, basically, you just forgive as much as is necessary. That's 70 times seven. That's what it means. A hyperbolically big number. So that you just go, oh, okay. And then Jesus gives this crazy illustration. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Let me just give you something scripturally. That is a retarded amount of money. 10,000 talents. We're talking like national debt levels here. I mean, the king that would allow any servant to owe him that much money would be an idiot. I don't think there's been a king that's ever sat on a throne that would have allowed somebody to run that debt level up. So when Jesus starts the illustration, he comes up with a ridiculously huge amount of debt. 10,000 may not sound like much. Anybody here ever owed 10,000 bucks? Yeah, every house that you've ever purchased, every most every car that you've ever purchased, right? I mean, it, it's 10,000 bucks isn't hard. 10,000 talents, way more than that. Way more than that. So Jesus starts there. And I think there's a reason for it in context. Remember when I said, you don't know how I was hurt? You don't know how I was hurt. I remember sitting on the day I was getting ready to do a wedding and listening to somebody else tell the story of their marriage falling apart and the hurts and the pains that had been done to them. It's pretty catastrophic stuff. Not easy to deal with. If you're here in the sanctuary and you've been horribly betrayed by a relative, by a spouse, it hurts. How many of you realize, though, that that fits under 10,000 talents? I love the story, uh, even though I don't know all the details. I don't know if you know, Pope John Paul II was shot by a Turkish man at one point a long time ago. And he went and he visited that man in jail. And he forgave him. Now, whether you are into Catholicism or you're not, or you know about its history or not, I, I, that's not even the point. How many of you realize he was doing something that Jesus was talking about here? Somebody tried to kill him. That's pretty bad. That's not like taking your parking spot. That, 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 that's bad. That's not just that, you know, they're trying to, you know, get your promotion away from you. They're trying to terminate you. And he went in and he forgave. Okay. It's not my right to hold on because it seems big. Think to yourself, next time a pain comes your way, and I wish I could tell you the pain wouldn't come your way, and I wish I could tell you that every pain was resolvable on Matthew 18, but if it happens not to be, is this a 10,000 talents sort of thing? It still fits. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. Again, how many of you have ever had to deal with a bankruptcy issue? Whether you've had it yourself or, you know, you somebody you know. Yeah, see, that exists. Imagine back in the day when they didn't do bankruptcy. They would just take you and sell you and everything that you have. So you owe 10,000 talents. Well, all your stuff is worth, you know, 28 bucks. Now you're a slave, you still owe 10,000 talents minus 28 bucks. 
Good luck. That was how debt was handled once upon a time. And this, at this point, the king has every right legally to do this. The person owns, he owes the money, and he couldn't pay. Do you realize that sometimes people have hurt your feelings and they can't always make it right? How do you make some pains right? And uh, that's true. Sometimes. You're right, Donnie. Sometimes you just have to deal with it. The person can't make it right. Verse 26. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. And I will pay you all. How many of you realize that that's a ridiculous statement? <laughs> like I said, this is national debt type. How many realize that the American national debt will never be paid off? Never. Never. There's no solution to that. I don't care if you're conservative or liberal. There's no road from $23 trillion in debt back to pay off. There's no road there. You know, the only thing they can do is say, we're not paying it. That, is, and that has all kinds of troubles of its own, doesn't it, Luke? Absolute financial chaos there. There's no road back. This guy's saying, have patience with me. Do you think that the king realized that this guy was never going to pay? That it was never going to be right? Yeah. And yet it says, then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Now, that's a biggie. Back in the days of absolute monarchy, you know, kings, he, the king had certain responsibilities, and yes, tax money came to him, but he also had to handle everything. So if you had a war, the king had to pay the, the soldiers, right? I mean, it wasn't like two totally separate books. So if this guy somehow owed 10,000 talents, national debt level stuff, and he forgives the debt, where is he going to come up with that 10,000 talents? His own pocket. This is going to hurt him personally. Here's the truth about forgiveness. Forgiveness hurts. Forgiveness hurts. It costs, if you want to use a nicer word, there's nothing wrong with that word, but, but think about it. Doesn't it? When you really want to tell somebody what for, and you, you want to put the pain that they've given you back on them, and you have to stop and say, I don't have a right to do this. This is God's situation. I forgive you. Forgiveness doesn't have a memory. You do realize that walking around going, I forgave you. Remember? I forgave you. I forgave you. You realize that that is manipulation. Which is trying to get the person to somehow make good for the pain that they caused you. Which means that you didn't forgive them. You've just tried to work the forgiveness, work the situation out in a way that makes you look better. To forgive somebody means that you don't go there again. Now, Brad. That's a good question, Fred. He doesn't say exactly who he's talking to. He just tells the story of a king. He doesn't make the king out to be specifically godly or ungodly, Jewish or not. You know, yes, we could assume some things. He's talking to Peter. They're both Jews, maybe. But, but he doesn't go there. And how many of you realize that forgiveness isn't always something that you have to just give to other believers? Which is not what Fred is saying. I'm not, I'm not putting those words in his mouth. You could have to forgive your boss. You ever have a boss that you just, they were just rotten people. Some of my staffers probably. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you have to forgive people who are just real scoundrels. But what about trust? 
with forgiveness? Isn't that a big question? And never hurt me once, shame on you. Hurt me twice, shame on me. So I should never trust you again because, but is that really forgiveness? Now, I will give you a bit of what I consider. I consider it wisdom. You may disagree with me. I don't think I would extend 100% trust in an instant. I think that'd be stupid. There is something in the legal terms called recidivism, you know, a, a habit of going back to the same crime that you did before. Some people are liars. They're likely to lie again. Some people are going to do bad things again. Well, that's true. Zero trust means I really have not forgiven you. We're back to that. But 100% trust is something that should be earned in any relationship, shouldn't it? So I don't necessarily think you have to be 100% trusting on the, on the turn of a moment. That would be, I think, unrealistic and maybe even unproductive. But to forgive, you do have to let something go. Now in this case, let's look a little farther. Verse 28. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which, by the way, is about a hundred days' wages. So in your own mind, think of, I don't want to know the number, but think of your, in your own mind about what a hundred days' wages would be. Do a little calculation for a minute. A hundred days of your money. Now some of you are students. You don't make really any money. You have an allowance. What's a hundred days of your allowance if you have such a thing? Some of you are retired, you're on a more fixed income, what's 100 days? How many of you realize that we take on debts all the time that are 100 days? I'm not asking about your credit cards, but a lot of Americans have way more than 100 days debt on their credit cards. How many of you ever bought a car? That's more than 100 days, <laughs> for sure or a house, or a cabin, or you name it, fancy vacation, you've probably put a, a hundred days load on there. So let's just call that in comparison to this incredible national debt level, you have somebody that has a far more reasonable debt. He laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. That's a pretty amazing concept for somebody who just was forgiven. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you a question. If we forgive this person of something, does it justify that we go and get somebody else back? I've asked the question a little different. I didn't say just like here, where if you've been forgiven by God, you go and hurt somebody else. That would be a good question and a good application, but not what I'm asking. How many of you have ever forgiven somebody and you feel like you've made this great sacrifice by forgiving them, but you're not going to sacrifice twice, doggone it. You're going to go get this other person and you're going to feel some level of, mm, I got my own back. It's a good question. How many of you know that kind of messes up the equation of forgiveness? Forgiveness doesn't say I just forgive you, but not him. Mike? Yeah, it can be. And it's funny how when I mentioned offense, how offense can mess with your memory. How many of you know that forgiveness issues can mess with your memory too? And here this guy had been forgiven this catastrophic thing. And yet he immediately goes and goes after somebody for a much smaller thing. It's like, okay, why don't you remember the goodness that was done for you. Now I started thinking about this whole, you know, seven times, seven, seven times 70 thing. Um, how many of you think you've probably been forgiven by God somewhere in excess of seven times 70? Do you, do you really, and this, this message is not primarily about sin, it's about how we deal with sins that come our way. But, but if you think about it for a minute, um, sin at its base is not... Um, just violating some minor command. If you're by yourself on a road in the sticks and there's no traffic, have you ever opened it up just, just a little? <laughs> just, the video cameras are not on you. You're safe. They're on me. Just a little, you know? 
I, I, mean, I remember I bought a Honda a long time ago. I think it was the first car I actually bought that was mine. It was a new car. And I just wanted to see how fast it would go. And I lived in this little town in Indiana. And the, the state highway that went on each side of, of, of I-69 there, you know, I'm sorry, 65, sorry, I-65 there, you know, if you went to the east, it got kind of busy, as busy as anything did in that part of Indiana. But if you went to the west of, of I-65, you were out in the middle of nowhere. Fowlerville looked like a megalopolis compared to the west side. <laughs> of I-65. And so I took my little Honda putt-putt and I got on the road and I started accelerating. And when it hit 105, I got nervous. <laughs> now, did I hit anybody? No. What would I have hit? Deer. Deer. Maybe. Yeah, I wasn't going to hit any people out there. You know? It wasn't going to happen. So, so how many of you would think, well, so I opened it up a little bit or I just violated the stupid little rule. If I don't get caught, what's the big difference, right? I mean, I didn't. I didn't go right by the one cop in the whole county, so I was okay. You know, I mean, I, I, I slowed down. I came back home. I told Diane. She called me an idiot. It was all right. You know, I just wanted to see, well, how fast it would go, and I still never did know because I, I chickened out. Sometimes I think we look at our sins that way, don't we? And we can even look at the way we might offend other people that way. It wasn't a big deal. Get over it. It wasn't a big deal. So I said this. So I went there. So I did that. It wasn't a big deal. Let it go. It's just a rule. But when we sin against God, we really are saying, I don't care what you want. I don't care what you said is good for me. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want to do. You now think about it for a second. Is sin any different because we don't think about it that way? Somebody cuts you off and you're ready to with a Jesus love you sticker on your, your, your car. <laughs> is it the end of the world? Are you going straight to hell? No, grace is real and he is good. But if you think about that, I'm representing Jesus in that situation horribly. We don't think about it that way. We don't always pay attention that way. But to understand, we said, I said, this memory thing is the problem. We tend to think that what somebody does to us is catastrophic and painful and unfair and unloving. And what we do to others, well, not such a big deal. And yet, in this scenario, we see that the man is forgiven. And just when the memory problem kicks in, immediately he forgets to forgive as well. And he would not. He said, the man says, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Ouch. <laughs> then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. So think about you and I. How many of you know that we are not independent contractors that throw an hour or two one way or another to God now and then? We are his servants. We are bought with a price. And so how... I said that, that for lack of forgiveness is an obstacle to discipleship. You're not serving the master the way the master served you. He forgave you and me way more than 490 times. He forgave us for our attitudes and our choices and our priorities. Sometimes he forgave us for giant potholes in our lives and things we are definitely not proud of. He forgave us. And if we walk around and we assume that what other people have done for, for, to us is so heinous, that we can never let that go, then we're forgetting the grace that he gave to us. So this king says, in, in the place of God, in this illustration, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? So now forgiveness doesn't become just a way to look good. You know, I love how nice I am. I forgave that loser. 
Forgiveness doesn't even just become a way to achieve personal peace. Is there value in achieving personal peace? Absolutely. But forgiveness actually becomes a way to emulate, to act like the master who redeemed us. Remember, discipleship is the road that brings us closer to behaving like God. Closer to valuing what God values. We can't get there by going the opposite direction. If I get out in my driveway and I turn to the east, the odds of me hitting Chicago is relatively limited. Right? If I keep going east, eventually I hit a spot where my car won't drive. We need to forgive. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. There's a, a thing to think about the next time about forgiveness. Okay, I can't resolve this. I can't just plow it out of the way. This is hard. This is down fast. I am slipping on this thing. i got to get this ice up. The only way to do it is for me to forgive, for me to lay down this act of forgiveness, for me to say I don't have the right to continue to do this. It's not good for me to continue to do this. I can't serve God effectively by continuing to do this. I have to choose to let it go. I have to choose. I have to start extending some level of trust and relationship again. Even if it's not 100%, I have to take a step. If I don't, I put myself in a place where I could jeopardize my own forgiveness by him. There was a motivation. How many of us would not want to be forgiven by him? I'm no good. So my heavenly father, so I love the fact that Jesus personalizes this. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Oh, yikes. That's pretty personal, isn't it? So here's how I would wrap this up today. I would love to think that all of us here in this congregation have done all the forgiving that we need to do. And I'm just preaching to the choir, right? You know, you already know all this. You already do all this. You're already good at this. And if that's true, praise the Lord. If you're sitting there and as far as you know in your mind and heart, you got nothing against anybody else, you're cool. If that's you, then just take this and salt it away. And the next time you get hurt down the road, you know what I mean, you can say, oh, this is how I'm supposed to handle it. Try to have the confrontation, try to deal with the facts, try to make sure I'm in the right line, and if they won't listen to any of that, I just need to forgive them. Good for you. Tuck that away. Let anybody here have some hurt in your heart, your mind? Anybody here been treated badly by somebody, or at least you think you have? Why do you have to make me? If you're here and you're struggling with that, and again, maybe you weren't struggling with it when you came. Maybe it wasn't the thing you were thinking about. But all of a sudden, you realize that, man, all somebody has to do is start talking about that person, that subject. And you start breathing a little quicker. And your mind starts pouring all kinds of negative memories in. You find it really, really easy to get angry. If that's you today, just lift your hand and say, I got somebody to forgive, Pastor. Some of you did it really quickly. Well, praise the Lord. That's honesty. I love it. I don't blame. I got somebody to forgive. I can tell you that in the story that I told you about my parents, as I said, God brought me to a place where finally it got resolved and I was able to forgive. And I'll remember the first time that person called me out of the blue. They never had any idea how angry I was. And they asked if I would do something for them. And I actually found it easy to say yes. And I don't say that to make myself look good. It, it, 
And any time in the, the prior three to four years to that, it probably would have been far easier to come up with some excuse to say no. Make myself look good and go, ha! But God had helped. As daft as I am at times, he helped me to forgive. And I pray for that individual almost every day because they're going through some real challenges in their life that have nothing to do with the situation that I was talking about. Nothing at all. 20 years earlier, I probably would have said how they deserved it. A lack of forgiveness will tear you up. Tear you up. Won't make you happier. Won't make you more successful. Won't make your Christian walk easier. So if you just lifted your hand and say, yeah, I've got somebody, some story that is tearing me up inside if I think about it. Today is maybe the day you deal with forgiveness. I'm not saying that what happened to you wasn't painful. I'm sure it was. And I have no knowledge about the motivations of the person that did it to you. Maybe they meant to do it and laughed as the blade slipped in. But if you carry that pain with you till you die, they've won a lot bigger battle. And they even set out to win. And you lose more than you ever thought. So God, today, especially those of us who can't salt this away and just say, this is for later. Those of us who've been offended, somebody in school said something mean about us. Somebody didn't like us when we liked them. We got messed over for a promotion and somebody stole it. We've been lied to. A spouse or a friend has betrayed us in some terrible way. We're disappointed with our kids, with our parents, with ourselves. We're angry. Lord Jesus, I ask you that you would help us to forgive. There's no secret here. There's no secret, you know, knowledge that we, we have to deal with. We simply have to choose to say, I am not going to let this bind me anymore. I'm not going to let this stand in the way of my freedom. I'm not going to let this stand in the way of my spiritual growth. I can't win and carry this anymore. So God, even though I may not feel like forgiveness, I ask you that you would help me to lay it down now. And God, the next time I hear about that person, and all those habits start to fly up again. God, I pray that you would help me to stop and say, oh, that's right, they're forgiven. I don't have a right to be angry anymore. Lord Jesus, let us see them differently than we ever have before. Thank you for giving us the tools to plow the snow away. Thank you even more for giving the tools to get rid of the ice that settles them and brings us down. Thank you for this mighty name. Amen. Now I promise you as you go that you, some of you are going to find pain. I hope not. I don't wish that for you. We live in a real world, right? Sometimes people are not paying attention and sometimes they're jerks and it, it is what it is. And sometimes you'll be able to resolve it. Resolve it when you can. When you can't, remember that you are a forgiven person and that you pass on. You're called to pass on that which you've received. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, I ask you for your blessing in this congregation. I pray that as they go, Lord, they remember over and over, not how much they've forgiven, but how much you've forgiven them. That's a nice thought sometimes, to remember all the stupid that you've washed away. Lord Jesus, every one of us, very much including this man right here, has a bad day. God, I thank you for your goodness. Walk with them until we meet again. God bless you today. Go forgive somebody.